Hey, hello everyone. Welcome. My name is Paul Keefe, business advisor here at the World Trade Center Winnipeg. I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that this webinar is coming to you from Treaty 1 territory, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oje Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. Thank you for joining our webinar, The Keys to Effective Employee Engagement and Retention for Sustainable Business Success, which will be presented by Ben Isakov and Laura Cusco. Before we begin, I want to share a few housekeeping items. Please send all of your webinar questions directly to the chat box at the top of your screen, and Ben and Laura will try to answer as many as they can throughout the webinar and during a Q&A session at the end. For all technical questions, please send them directly to the chat box, and I will answer them as soon as possible. And lastly, you will also receive a PDF copy and recording of this presentation within the next week. And uh, now it's time to start our webinar. I would like to introduce you to the presenters. Ben is the owner of Congruent Clarity, as well as the strategic partnership and venture support lead with the Stu Clark Center for Entrepreneurship. With over 20 years in QA and CI positions, three successful certifications and an ISO lead auditor certification, Ben has extensive experience in quality management systems and process standardization. Laura is a human resources executive with over 23 years experience, 13 years in a leadership capacity and eight years coaching. She has worked in public and private sectors, unionized and non-unionized companies and within various industries. She is a big picture thinker and enjoys working with teams, being strategic and proactive in problem solving and promoting harmonious relations. She has a proven ability to create structures that provide an engaged and productive workforce with leadership skills that provide guidance and coaching to help change organizations. Welcome, Ben Laura. Take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you. Uh, so we are very excited uh, to be with you today. And uh, without further ado, let's we'll just jump into the presentation. So uh, you've done such an amazing job for introducing us. So we will not go over our slides to introduce ourselves and we will jump right into it. So, and we will start with uh, mastering your engagement strategies. Uh, okay, give me seconds and we will have a first poll right now. So while they're bringing up the poll, I just want to uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Paul and the World Trade Center. And uh, yes, Ben and I are excited to, to be here today. So do we have a poll uh, launched already? Okay, here we go. Yeah, the poll is up if everyone yes. wants to select their answer on there. I better do it too, okay. right? Yeah, I will. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like um, the majority of people here today do have uh, some sort of employee engagement survey, and uh, that is is great as a tool for uh, employee engagement and retention strategy planning. So when you are putting together an employee engagement survey, uh, we suggest considering the employee's life cycle. So that starts with things like uh, attraction, recruitment, onboarding, development, retention, and separation. So this is part of your initial assessment uh, for your strategy. You want to also, while you do uh, an employee engagement survey, also look at what your current practices are. What policies do you have in place? Assess your own culture internally as well and then put these two assessments together and come forward with uh, what could be an effective um, organizational recruitment, uh, retention, and, and engagement strategy for you. So we'll go to uh, the next slide. Uh, once you've come up with uh, some recommendations that you've put together from your survey, as well as from your own assessment, you want to make sure that those um, are presenting a strong business case that are going to align uh, as well with the overall organizational uh, strategic planning, the, the, the organizational goals, 
and how do these integrate together? How do they align with your organization's mission, vision, and values? And uh, as well, uh, at part of that, engaging the stakeholders is then ensuring that you have the necessary resources, uh, including the people and the budget to move forward with uh, further planning. Okay, so when when we speak about uh, engaging uh, engaging your people, like Laura said, we start with the top level and we look on the uh, aligning of the organization with the top uh, top level values, vision, mission, uh, vision, uh, mission statement, core values, which is super important, and and the big goals for the organization. So uh, we've learned that when people are being part of the strategic planning uh, process, they will be naturally more and more engaged because uh, they will understand not only what they need to do uh, that you are asking them to do, but also why they need to do it. And uh, studies are showing that people that understand why they need to do specific things are more willing to do it. And uh, additionally, if you think about it, uh, when we are part, like your your team is part of the organizational pl strategic planning process, each one of the team members will know not only what and why they do, but also what and why other people in the organization are doing. And it will it will help to align everyone with, uh, with everyone and the goals of the organization. And when we when we uh, start this process, so we will drill uh, down from the top level values and goals into the uh, pretty much daily and weekly activities for each one of the team members. And this will end up in the individual one page strategic plans for uh, each one of the uh, uh, team members. So uh, instead of uh, you distributing a large document with all of the goals and every activity in every KPI for the organization, you create a simple one page document for, for a member and they know exactly what they need to do, why they need to do it, when it needs to be done, and more importantly, how uh, what whatever the tasks are uh, or goals are in their one page uh, strategic plan contributing to achieving the, the bigger goal. And then when when you uh, communicate all of this and you create a, a one page strategic pl uh, plan for each one of the members and everyone understand that, all you need to do is uh, to establish measurable uh, outcomes and you need to establish the boundaries of accountability. Uh, it's not about uh, micromanagement people uh, because nobody likes to be micromanaged, but it's more about establishing expectations and working with your people on uh, on uh, clearing obstacles between them and their goals. So uh, you will meet with them, you will go over the one pager and you will say, OK, well, this is what we agreed that we are going to do. OK, these are the time, time frames. Let's let's see how we can make it happen. And your goal, once again, is to not police them, but to find out what are the obstacles and engage them in the continuous improvement uh, process through the PDCA cycle plan, do check, act cycle, uh, uh, saying, okay, well, this is what we were planning to do. Uh, that's what we've achieved, good or bad, how we can do it better. And and uh, when people know and understand the grand theme of, of, of the organization and the goal and the dire goals and directions, it's easier for them to be uh, an active part of it and being an active part naturally gets them more engaged with uh, was, uh, what we need to do. Okay, so in order for you to do all of this and to do it effectively, uh, you need to look, uh, first of all, at yourself as a leader in the organization. And we are looking on, um, on the leadership skills. So how you can optimize your leadership skills. And there is a poll that is out there right away uh, asking you about your leadership skills. So read it through and pick the one that will be applicable the most to you. Okay, no dicta dictators in the room, I see. <laughs> uh, Where are you, Ben? I'm permissive. I'm. I. You know what, uh, Paul? I like. There is like in in uh, in air forces. There is a. Um, 
a class of ammunition that calls launch and forget. It's just you aim it, you push the button, and then it does its work. You don't need to track it. You don't need to touch it anymore. So I'm a big proposer, uh, a proposer of, of launch, and, uh, launch and forget. I'm getting somebody. I'm explaining what needs to be done. They explain it back to me, and then I let them do the work because I've hired them to do the work and not to manage them. So, But we see 67% uh, democratic and 33% permissive. We don't have any... Uh, uh, dictators and we don't have any authoritarians in the room but uh, okay let's let's speak about it a little bit more so let's go over the different styles okay so it's not something that i invented i've adopted it from from other trainings that i've done but i really liked the i really liked the deviation and i define four different types of leadership autocratic is when uh you say I decide what needs to be done, and I will tell you what you will do. So uh, in this case, uh, the cons and pros uh, for everyone, right? On the pros side, the benefit of it, it is super fast. You just make a decision on the spot. You say what needs to be done, and things are moving in the right direction. So the benefit of it is uh, it is super fast. It is rapid decision making. You are not stuck in the conversations and stuff like that. On the negative side, everything is on you as a leader of the organization. Nobody is trained to make their own decisions. And also, that is not the best one to keep your employees engaged, if you think about it. So uh, so on the, on the negative side, on the long run, that is going to burn you down and uh, out. And then um, you will have like a very passive team that is working with you. Uh, so uh, authoritarian, I will come to my team and I will say, okay, folks, what do you think we need to do? And we will have a conversation and then I will make a sole decision of what, what we do. And I will, uh, I will, I will tell you what, what needs to happen on the benefits of it. We are leveraging other people's uh, skills, opinions, and knowledge, right? And uh, and uh, we as leaders, we can make a more uh, informed decision uh, and a better decision, uh, pretty much. On the opposite side, once again, it's not as engaging as it could be. And then uh, it's still your decision. Uh, so like it is an in-between uh, uh, scenario, uh, not my favorite one, uh, to be honest with you. On the democratic, it's pretty simple. I gather the team, we brainstorm stuff, and then we decide what is going to be the best course of action for, for the team, all of us. Uh, this one, th This one is going to be the slowest one. Uh, you may find yourself stuck in the discussion and in the arguments, uh, but it uh, engages people a lot, and it is an opportunity for you to see and identify next leaders in your organization based on how they make decisions, based on how they uh, have the conversation and, and their ideas. Uh, and the last one, which is my favorite, probably, like I said already, is the permissive one. I hired you to do the job. So here is the situation. I give you a carte blanche to decide, and I'm okay with whatever you do, and I'm not going to uh, judge you uh, uh, unless you've done a good job and, and the result is uh, proper. So if, uh, if, if you ask us, we will say that uh, it's not a good idea to pick one of these and follow only one style. Uh, there is supposed to be a combination of each one of them. So uh, use your uh, discretion. Keep in mind now you will be able to keep in mind these different styles and ask yourself which one of them is more suitable for current situation. Okay, and, and the balances are in there. So uh, when you speak about and you think about adopt, uh, adopting your leadership style, uh, uh, post-COVID world added more complexity to this question. It was always a problem. It was always challenging, but now we've added more complexity to it. So not only not only we have the in-person positions and you need to work with them and you adopt your style, but now we have hybrid and the remote positions. And not each one of these styles will be suitable for them. So 
We will put the site in person. It's straightforward. You understand how you can apply all four of the styles. Uh, the more problematic one is uh, remote positions, right? Uh, I was uh, preparing a training for the hybrid and remote uh, work uh, workplaces. And one of the big issues, if you are looking on the uh, authoritarian or autocratic styles, you have a big problem with remote positions because there is a very limited ability to micromanage people, and 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 it just it's not feasible. So you need to you need to apply the democratic and the permissive one more than more than ever before. Uh, so, uh, so when we look on the, the uh, leadership styles, look on the look on the you know limitations of the on the setups. Uh, with hybrid being the most uh, uh, favorable, the way that we see it, the most favorable uh, direction going forward, it allows you to exercise the democratic and permissive even more and kind of put it in into place in the in-person positions as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, go ahead, Laura, sorry. Yeah, no problem, thank you. Uh, so next we're going to talk about uh, training and development. So we've done um, our assessment right through the employee survey, as well as through your own internal analysis. Uh, you've now assessed yourself as, as a leader, and um, we've talked about uh, the different types of environments that uh, workplaces have right now. Uh, it is important for workplaces to be flexible though. So um, at part of this new uh, world of work is, is people wanting different kinds of flexibilities. And so that takes us into uh, training and development. So leaders are needing to learn to uh, lead differently than they have before. Workers are, are expecting to work different than they have before. This is all going back to the uh, engagement and retention uh, strategies. So in order to um, look at training and development, it's important for the leaders as well as the employees to do some learning together. And you wanna promote that shared understanding of of what the future looks like for the both parties as well as the workplace uh, into the future. So uh, we know we've heard before people they say people don't leave organizations they leave leaders and um, you know that may or may not be true there's usually a variety of other reasons that uh, people are leaving organizations but the reality is that leaders do create a large part of the employee's experience. And so it's important for the, the, the leaders to understand that their role is impacting uh, others than just themselves. And it's becoming more important for them specifically to develop some of those soft skills, uh, compassion, empathy is uh, more important than ever before. Also, because of um, the, the, the leanness of people as you go to recruit and getting the right people with the right skills, looking at creating a, a culture internally of, of a training and development organization, it's important to maintain upskilling and reskilling of your current employees make that a priority. Maybe you look at uh, creating a budget for training where certain people get a certain amount of budget per year to to show that, that that's important um, to the organization, to the leader, and to them to, to keep on, on developing themselves. Also, different programs like succession planning programs in an organiza organization, making sure that you have somebody uh, you know, identified as as a possibility and where there isn't that person starting to develop a, maybe a mentoring plan to bring that person up to where you may need them. Um, and of course, there's, uh, you know, the, the baby boomers that we've been talking about, there's a large portion of the population, work population that will uh, be exiting. 
And of course, acknowledging that there's uh, the artificial intelligence, AI is having a huge impact on, on the way we, we run our organizations as well. So the upskilling, reskilling um, is very important for, for everyone. We'll move to the next slide, uh, Ben, on communication. So with any strategic uh, plan, uh, it's important to maintain communication throughout um, the execution of that. So throughout the assessment, throughout the implementation, and throughout the ongoing um, uh, PDCA cycle, right? So part of that is the ongoing and open communication, providing regular feedback, uh, and that's happening at all levels. It's important uh, to be transparent. So if, uh, if why you're doing something, I think Ben spoke to this earlier, what are we doing and why? Uh, if something failed, let's let's acknowledge that. Uh, let's let's be open and honest and and transparent and talk about it. Let's talk about how we're going to change directions and why. Uh, let's be re clear again with the expectations then about how things are changing. Um, and and why they're changing. Uh, the second point there is about scheduling uh, regular meetings, right? So it's uh, important going back to uh, the earlier slide of those employees having their one pagers of of expectations and and goals. Uh, it's important to continue to check in with them. Uh, through regular structured meetings. How are they doing? What kind of support do they need to to help them to achieve them? What kind of collaboration? We're going to talk more about collaboration. What kind of collaboration efforts can maybe help them uh, to support them? So having those regular uh, scheduled check-ins uh, help. And whether it's uh, going back to the different environments, it doesn't matter if it's a in-person uh, position or if it's a hybrid or if they're working remote, having that opportunity to uh, check in and having that uh, scheduled dedicated time to uh, just touch base is important. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move um, into talking about uh, more on creating a, a positive culture. And we do have a new poll for you uh, in the chat there. So we want to look at uh, what percentage of organizations show employee mental health as a major concern right now? It looks I, like it's uh, it's fluctuating a little bit, but uh, it looks like the majority of people have have guessed there that it's 66 percent. So we'll move on to the next slide, uh, Ben. I think I led by example with the wrong uh, wrong uh, answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Ben uh, put some humor in there about the inflation and um, definitely inflation is is uh, a major concern for people right now that is creating a lot of concern uh, for mental health. And so but when we look at there was a survey uh, from the Society of Human Resource Management uh, for 2023 into 2024, uh, it showed that employee mental health was the second greatest concern for organizations behind inflation. And so, uh, again, inflation is is creating some of that um, mental health concern, but it was already a, a concern for organizations. Uh, this came up more during the pandemic uh, that had a huge impact uh, on, on employees' mental health. And it continues to, to be an ongoing now concern and focus for organizations. So uh, the Mental Health Commission of Canada has a number of, of great resources uh, that I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention today. There is um, a standard, uh, 
a national standard called the psychological health and safety in the workplace standard, although it is not a mandatory standard like other health and safety uh, regulations. It is an optional standard for organizations, but it, uh, again, with a great greater concern on this area uh, to incorporate some of the, the 13 uh, standards that they have within that, within your workplace, maybe uh, bringing it to your health and safety committee or uh, to your wellness committee, if you have either one of those. Uh, one of those committees could look at uh, the different factors that are mentioned within that standard um, as a as a as a point to start with with maybe some some ideas for things to do different within the organization. So uh, while we speak about mental health, right, and uh, uh, I, I, I think in our opinion, uh, the, the reason for, for increased concerns with mental health is because the stress levels are going up and they are constantly, constantly going up. So you as the leader of the organization, uh, it is your responsibility to resolve conflicts inside the organization, within the teams, and between you and the teams, quite honestly, as well. Uh, and if uh, uh, the more effective you are in resolving the conflicts in the, in the right way, the better the, better the, the uh, environment will be, the healthier will be the environment. So one of the things that uh, we see a lot, and Laura will uh, we'll see even more of that, we have a tendency to uh, avoid conflicts and avoid the conversations in the hopes that uh, problems will solve themselves. So guess what? Uh, they never do. Uh, and what happens if you are avoiding the difficult conversations or you have something in your mind and you are not speaking it up and you are not allowing other people to speak up what is there uh, in their minds, on their minds, uh, it will just root it in and then like it will build up one on another and then eventually uh, it will uh, burst and people will leave and they will disengage because, uh, because you know, because these are in conflict and nobody understands and nobody remembers where and how did it start. So uh, the keys for effective problem solving, the way that we think about it, is assertive communication, first of all. So uh, you have to have open communication channels. You have to nurture environment when people are comfortable and uh, uh, confident as well that they can speak up uh, their minds, that they will be uh, heard and they are not going to be judged for what they are saying. Uh, use some empathy. You know what? Uh, we all have our own experiences. We all have our own uh, ways of seeing the world. We react to different triggers differently. So uh, try to understand why people are reacting the way they are uh, instead of judging the, the outcomes and the results and the words that they're using. Okay, um, another one, um, which is applicable, actually all of this applicable to any everywhere, not only uh, uh, to the workspaces, but uh i by me personally like i'm putting a lot of attention on myself on on the next one on the listening right uh think about it this way if you are in the middle of the conflict how many times you are listening in order to listen and understand and not listening and waiting for your turn to speak and you're keeping these arguments inside your head, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say that. So guess what? You are on your side. You are trying to be right. You are trying to prove your point and missing out completely the second side. Effective communication starts when you start to listen and you start to try and understand other people's reasons. And it is okay if you will forget all of your brilliant arguments if you understood the other person and you understood the other side and you know how, what is the best way uh, to move forward, which brings us to collaboration. Uh, at the end of the day, especially when we speak about the work uh, workplace, uh, nothing like majority of the things should not be personal in there, right? We are all coming in uh, to achieve specific goals. We are coming in with specific ideas of uh, what needs to happen. 
And if the organization was good at the aligning the teams together in achieving these goals, and we cascaded the goals properly from the top down, uh, it will create a, a, an opportunity for a healthy, uh, healthy uh, argument and collaboration. So uh, it's all about uh, understanding where my work starts and ends and when somebody else and if i see that somebody else is behind i'm not i'm not nurturing a culture when like i've done my part of the job now i'm waiting and i will pointing fingers on laura right now because our presentation is not right i've done my slides and she's not doing her job so it, this kind of thing you see uh uh if if you work uh in a collaborative uh, uh environment things will start moving faster for everyone. And uh, coming back to one page uh, strategic plans, when you have areas of responsibilities and expectations set up for everyone, and everyone understand what are the expectations from everyone and why the expectations are there, people will be more engaged and the conflicts are going to be resolved much easier because you will say, hey, look, that's what I need to do. This is how I can support you. Let's do it together. Okay, and it moves us uh, gradually into uh, teamwork and collaboration. So uh, with, uh, with the collaboration, right, I will ask you this. Uh, what, what value can it, uh, can it provide to your environment, right? Think about your workplace and, uh, and uh, on the teams that you are working with or you are part of these teams and imagine what would happen if each one of you will be part of that uh, collaborative work and you will work together and you will really truly care about um, goals of your uh, team members and you will keep it in mind and you will do your best to do part of your job so it will help them to do their jobs the best that they could, right? It is it is a huge uh, it is a huge value add uh, to uh, to the culture of the company, and again, uh, like Laura said, people are, people are, people are leaving companies uh, uh, for a reason. They are leaving bad managers and they are leaving bad teams, and I've seen it so many times uh, when uh, when you look on on a position or you look on a workplace and it's not like you know not even close to be a fancy or prestigious position, but people are just staying there because it is a healthy team and they just love to be there, right? So uh, creating creating environment that people love to be there will uh, create a huge value uh, in uh, uh, retention rates uh, for your organization. Okay, so... Uh... I want to just share a fun fact before I move on to talking more about this slide. So when people are are stressed at work uh, due to a conflict uh, or another uh, reason, their cortisol levels uh, increase within their body, right? So uh, it's actually science that says uh, that this will then, as the cortisol releases into our body when we're stressed, it will cause our memories actually to shrink. And so while our memories are shrinking, it is also increasing our, our blood sugar levels in our body, and it also increases our heart rate. You know, you feel your heart maybe palpitating uh, when you're at work and when you're stressed. Uh, and it sends us into our flight or uh, fight response mode, right? So then that goes to what Ben was saying. Sometimes you can't like listen, you can't, you know, hear someone else because you're you're in your your fight and flight mode. So all of that, obviously, within your body is taking away all the energy. It doesn't allow you to be productive. It doesn't allow you to be creative. It is creating uh, a negative uh, environment, not only within your own body, uh, within the external environment as well. And so uh, it is important for uh, workplaces to look at 
uh, having a, a workplace wellness program that looks at the person as a whole, right? Having a holistic approach to that. Um, historically, uh, workplaces might have had uh, a workplace wellness program. They might have, you know, referred to it as, oh, we have a gym uh, reimbursement program or, uh, you know, we have a walking group or something like that. It was very focused maybe on the physical um, aspects of uh, somebody's wellness. But in 2024, it's important to look at your people as a whole and having a more holistic approach to your programs. So you want to make sure, um, again, it has the financial aspect, for example. We talked about uh, inflation. It is something that is on every person's mind. So does your program include something to support your people's financial wellness? So you can look at um, things like having somebody come in and giving a presentation maybe on retirement or maybe on budgeting, things like that would be something to, to support them in that area. Uh, when you look at the spiritual, so are they able to connect with something greater uh, than themselves that will help to guide them and their actions? So yes, they want to have uh, a connection to their, their job. They want to have a connection to the organization. They want to have a connection to their manager. Um, but the, to order, in order to have that connection, there needs to be shared values, right? So it's important for, uh, for the individual to understand, are they connected to the mission, vision, and values of the organization? And is that something that they believe in themselves and that will uh, then fulfill their own sense of purpose. Uh, intellectual, so that goes back to the training and development one, the importance of, of having some active uh, participation in scholastic or maybe cultural or community activities even. So as you look at these, uh, you know, for some workplaces, you might ha not have a big budget, some things don't necessarily need to have uh, a large budget. So think of, uh, you know, maybe they can expand their knowledge through, you know, having a library in the workplace. Um, so one option is to pay for them maybe to take that course outside, but maybe there's an option for, for just providing some reading material in the workplace. Uh, the next one is emotional. So this is all your self-care, relaxation, the stress reduction, um, resolving those, those conflicts, right? Uh, making sure that they have uh, a good sense of, of inner peace. And then, of course, the traditional, like uh, the physical aspects. Uh, you know, having some sort of physical activity, but also expanding that to include things like nutrition, uh, sleep. So maybe uh, there's, you know, a, a healthy snacks uh, being offered in the workplace or at least healthy options within a vending machine, things like that. Uh, your social aspects. So maybe there's a social committee internally that you have. Um, but making sure that you're fostering the relationships in the workplace, maybe that's just through the collaborations and the teamwork that uh, Ben talked about previously, but making sure that there's options within the workplace for people to develop those healthy, uh, supportive relationships. Uh, the occupational, that's, uh, again, making sure that uh, the person is, is having a good work-life balance. So um, making sure that they are, are having a healthy uh, sense of, of personal satisfaction outside of, of the workplace, as well as being financially uh, rewarding inside the workplace. And lastly is the environmental. So uh, this is bringing about different awarenesses to daily habits that people have uh, on the physical environment. So minimizing harm, that could include your, your safety and health program, but also any uh, like recycling program and just your whole environmental sustainability uh, programs internally. 
so all this uh, maybe looks like a lot and uh, I, I will really strongly recommend you to have a chat with Laura about it and mm -hmm. how you can apply some practical uh, practical um, uh, tips and uh, you know uh, aspects of it uh, but moving forward we will speak about uh, best practices and um, you know like based on my experience anytime I will uh, enter or step into the business for an audit and I will jump into root cause analysis for things that are not complying or not working on uh, or things that are not matching what what needs to be done uh, in most of the cases, uh, one of the uh, root causes will be broken communication. So when we speak about uh, uh, best practices, uh, I do believe that smart people learn from uh, other people's mistakes. And that's why we need the best practices. But in the scope of today's uh, webinar, we are going to speak about communication. Okay, and one of the things that we are looking at, uh, at the communication, uh, you need to develop uh, and put uh, your uh, policies in place, okay? And uh, when I say a word policy, right, many of you will uh, envision like a large document, very formal verbiage, you know, uh, boring, not really understandable, and like almost like a waste of uh, reading time. But uh, in uh, in our opinion, and the way that Laura and myself are working with uh, with our documents, uh, policy is supposed to serve the purpose, and uh, and the purpose of the policy is to help people in alignment of uh, their course of actions. Policy will say this is how we do things, and this is how we don't do things, and that's why. So uh, when you develop your policies uh, in in these in these areas, you need to set up clear expectations. Okay, so you need to to set uh, guidelines to people and say, okay, well, this is what is expected from you as part of the organization. These are the expectations, your expectations from us as an organization, right? And uh, it needs to be clear and understandable. We always encourage you to use uh, a simple language when you develop your documents and policies, because again, these documents are not for uh, posting them on the internet and uh, bragging about uh, the language, but about people understanding that. So speak and use language that people will uh, understand. Uh, reinforcement. Uh, when uh, you do a good job in hiring the right people to the right uh, job and you use your top values, especially core values, uh, as part of your hiring process, reinforcement will be easier. But, uh, I, and it is maybe something that uh, you may argue with me, but I do believe that uh, you cannot uh, operate only with the carrots. Sometimes you need to use sticks in the organization as well. And there is reinforcements is just the uh, setting expectations on 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 the on the sticks. okay? So okay, that's what uh, that is what expected from you. That's your that is what you've signed in to do, okay? You can expect all of the good things to happen when you when you you uh, you are. Uh, you know, working, can you giving what you expected from you? But these are also a, a consequences of you not performing. And it's again, it's not about policing. It's not about being micromanagement and being against the people. Of course, you need to make sure that you eliminate all other obstacles between your people and their goals. And the last resource is just their unwillingness to do the job. Only then you can reinforce it. And uh, and at the same time, you know what, uh, you need to set the policies to ensure organizational compliance. And compliance can be in so many different uh, aspects. It can be compliance with uh, uh, government uh, HR regulations, can be compliance with uh, uh, your in industry standard, uh, uh, you know, industry uh, standards or, and whatnot. But uh, all, all in all, when you reflect on everything that we spoke before that, 
all of this needs to be uh, reflected in your policies in a way that people will understand. Now, the very, very important portion of it, yes, let's develop the policies. We will set up the clear expectations. People will know what we'll do to enforce it, right? But uh, what if you are cutting corners? Okay, so I've seen it number of times when a, a, a leader of the organization, the top uh, top manager or CEO, will set up rules and will say, okay, well, this is what we are going to do, and that's how we are operate. But then an angry customer calls them directly, and the manager comes down to the shop floor, cuts every possible corner, puts everything aside, and pushes this job forward. So. Imagine what will happen. Like people will not take uh, any of the policies seriously because if one person can break break the rule, that is not the rule anymore. Okay, so you need to start and you need to embrace the change by following it yourself. If you want your organization to be based on the handshake agreements, keep your word. And you know, no matter what, do what you've promised to do. Uh, do not use any shortcuts because, again, uh, it is pretty similar to uh, parenting, I guess. It doesn't matter if uh, you teach your kids, uh, you know, exercise and uh, and eat healthy food. If all they see you doing is eating uh, uh, junk food and drinking beer on your couch, you know, watching uh, a TV series every evening, right? So they will they will see and they, it will not be congruent. They will not believe you. So they will not follow your example. Uh, and be as transparent as possible. So uh, I believe that when when people see what you do and people see how much effort you put into it, uh, uh, it will encourage them. It will it will show them an example of of yes, we 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 can do it too. So if if my manager, if my leader is putting that much effort into it, maybe I will put a little bit more into it. Uh, to the business owners in the audience, or uh, to the business owners that are listening to it, one very important. Uh, uh, note in here, do not expect the same level of commitment from your employees as from you as a business owner. They are, they are not owners, they are not founders, they are employees. So you need to scale down your expectations, right? But once again, if you are transparent and you are, if you are the hardest working person in, in the organization, it will show up and you will hire people that will be uh, following your lead. Okay, so let's uh, let's see um, another poll that we're going to have right now. Yeah, so it'll be in your chat. So when managers recognize the employees' efforts, what percentage uh, do you think their engagement goes up by? It looks like the majority of people are, are agreeing with the 40 percent, and uh, that is the correct amount. So uh, again, in a Harvard Business Review uh, showed that employees were 40 percent more engaged when their managers were great at recognizing their efforts. It provided them with more comfort and more confidence uh, in their own abilities and uh, wanted, they then wanted to, of course, uh, do more. So to build a culture of rec recognition, it's important to be clear uh, with the, the recognition, going back to the policy, having a policy, being clear with what kind of, of recognition you have, being specific with uh, criteria on how people would necessarily be uh, recognized and communicating those to people so that they are aware. Um, going back to the uh, one of the first slides on the employee's uh, life cycle, look at the employee's life cycle and and prioritize um, each area of the employee's experience. So maybe that is, you know, they're uh, having uh, recognizing years of service. Maybe that is the uh, offers of, of training and development or mentorship. Maybe that is, uh, you know, getting uh, 
a, a monetary uh, amount when you uh, refer somebody for employment. So there's different options, uh, but recognize each of the areas of the life cycle within your recognition uh, program. Uh, the next one is ensuring there is a connection, again, to the overall uh, organization's value and overall purpose. So when you do have a recognition program, uh, make sure that it is going to get you the result that you're looking for by that recognition, making sure you understand what it is you want to achieve through the recognition and then ensuring that it's it's getting that result for the organization. And when you are giving a recognition, recognition doesn't always have to be monetary. Uh, maybe it's just words of encouragement. Maybe it's a, a high five. Whatever it is, make sure it's something that is uh, meaningful for the employee and it is the way that they want to be recognized. Because there's different uh, people that have different motivations and each of their motivations uh, will mean that they have, uh, you know, different expectation in terms of, of recognition. But uh, one important thing is to uh, keep it simple as well and make sure that it's fun for, for employees, make sure that they want to be part of it. And of course, um, having the right people in the organization uh, recruiting the right people from the start leads to having that good engagement and good retention. And so ways to, to ensure that you have the right people are to act fast. When you, when you put up a posting, um, the timeliness to interview, the timeliness to respond, um, you know, if you, if you leave it too long, people, good people will get a job before you can actually get to them if you are not moving uh, fast when you post. Having uh, fair wages. Um, now, fair doesn't have to be the highest wage. Uh, it's it's the overall package, right, that you're bringing as an organization. Having good benefits, uh, having a good environment, uh, but also then having a fair wage. So just paying fairly. Uh, so the next one, as I said already, is is having good benefits as well. And the succession planning. So when people are coming in, uh, showing them the path maybe to their future uh, is is also important to keep them once you've you've got them in the door. So finding and recruiting uh, talent with the necessary skills for organization is a priority of 70% of the organizations out there for 2024. And um, it is again, one, among ones of the, one of the top three priorities. Uh, and of course that's next to uh, the employee morale internally, and then the engagement and retention uh, of the top talent. So, uh, it is falling third behind, of course, those other ones. Uh, so I think that brings us uh, to the end there and uh, opening it up. I think we have some some time for, for questions if anybody has a question. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben and Laura. That was fantastic. Loads of information. Hopefully everyone took some notes. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, everyone will be getting uh, copies of these slides. So that's great. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to use the raise your hand feature. You could come uh, off your unmute your mic and we'll address you one at a time or put the questions in the chat box. Um, I know we're coming up to the hour pretty quick, so I won't go through the full spiel of upcoming events, but I just dropped uh, <laughs> upcoming ones in the uh, in the chat there. So please check those out. We have some great webinars coming up. Very, uh, very important stuff. Um, but yeah, no questions just yet. So I'll kick things off. So um, with small business services, I deal with a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs with idea to start one employee to five, five to ten, that very small you know, number of its staff, how can they integrate these sorts of strategies for boosting employee engagement, like right from day one, and then maybe as the, the business scales? Um, do you want to answer it or I will start, Laura? Uh, you could start if you want, I'll fill in. Uh, okay, so it's a great question. And in matter of fact, I think 
That's actually uh, that's actually an easier start when you have a small team. It's so much easier to launch uh, to launch all of these programs uh, because uh, you have less people to communicate with. Right. Everything is simpler. So uh, your organization is small. Your goals are straightforward. Everyone knows exactly what everyone else is doing. Uh, so uh, and it is a great start to start uh, building up your company on the right foundation with uh, with the right culture. So start again, start with the communication. Don't call, don't call policies policies, call it whatever. OK, but make make sure that there is a document that everyone will read and agree so anytime they speak about your business and anytime that you and with them are hiring you are on uh, in alignment to bring more people that are align aligned with the right you know with with the team 100 yeah. percent, that's great I yeah, I would I would agree uh, with you, Ben. I think the foundation pieces are the key for any startup. So the foundation is is having that initial vision uh, of the business and what the the first goals are uh, of the organization, and then having some some policies. If you don't if you don't call it that, but maybe like a handbook, right? Something that I identifies um, the expectations of employees coming in and then ensuring that they have those structures uh, for them to to be successful, right? Uh, understanding their their job, how they fit to the whole, having their own goals, like all the things that we've kind of gone through um, during today's session. OK, no, that's awesome. Uh, looks like some people have been starting to sign off, so I know we're coming up to the top of the hour. There's no more questions, but I'll ask one more, um, and this might be for you, Laura. It was on your slide. It was on like the the joint training. Um, so like, what does collaborative team learning like look like to you? I guess like any actionable recommendations that uh, a manager can take for their for their team on this regard. I think yeah, I think it's important for. Uh, you know, there's there's different trainings within the organization that may be mandatory, and then there's others that, you know, become optional uh, as people maybe identify for themselves. And uh, and when it comes to, to those mandatory training that is more company-wide, again, I just think it's important for uh, the or the individuals, all the individuals in, within the workplace to see that all levels have participated in those and understand them so that they are able to then um, reinforce it after the training. If there are any questions, they can and then going to what Ben had said, leaning by the example, following any of those those trainings. OK, yeah. no, that's great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Ben, Laura, that this has been a fantastic session and, uh, you know, thanks everyone for tuning in again. Check the chat there for upcoming events. Subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay on top of them. Uh, check our events calendar. We got lots of great content um, and that's all we have for the for the day. Um, mm -hmm. No questions from anyone, so you must have just uh, packed them full of information and maybe we'll we'll get some. You'll get some emails afterwards. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, and while you were speaking, I registered myself to, well, not to put it in calendar, sorry. The one in April 17th with uh, Todd and, uh, and Mick. Okay, awesome. That's yeah, going that, to be a very, very interesting one. Yeah, the, the WTC Talks is our live and in, in-person event. So any entrepreneurs, please come out. It's going to be an awesome event. And, uh, and yeah, thanks so much, Laura. Thanks, Ben. It's been a pleasure. And have a great Bye. rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.